this. Um, uh, okay. Uh, enable. Okay, we're going to start. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Growing Squash, presented by UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center, Slow Food Lake Tahoe, and Master Gardeners of Lake Tahoe. And tonight, we're very fortunate to have as our speaker, David Long. He is a resident expert on all things garden in Lake Tahoe. He's lived here for over 20 years, and he's been an avid gardener for the past 30 plus years. He is a master gardener here in Lake Tahoe. He works on the Grow Your Own Committee for the past several years. He also volunteers at the gardens in the Tahoe, in the Tulac Historic Site, focusing on the charming vegetable garden area. And in addition to all of his gardening, he finds time to do volunteer work with the UC Tahoe Environmental Research Center, primarily at the Tahoe City Field Station. His other hobbies are skiing and fly fishing, and he also makes a mean banana cluster. He is retired, but he did have a career in the environmental and remediation field. So with that, we will take it away, Mr. Long, and he will explain everything else that you need to know about what's going on tonight. Thank you. Okay, everybody give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and see me or see the slides. Great. Okay, uh, the host, okay. So if you have questions or comments at the end of this uh, presentation uh, or during the conversation, the presentation, use the chat function and do the QA to the host. There should be a, on the list uh, says host. So use that. And then uh, as uh, almost always, the participants will be muted during the presentation and then following the Q&A session, we'll open it up for any additional uh, questions off the cuff that you guys may have, and you can ask them to me uh, directly. Um, the Master Gardeners um, University of California Extension does not endorse any products that may be mentioned, and I'll mention one or two products just because um, I'm going to, but we're not necessarily recommending, it's just an observation using a, a specific product. So that's what that's all about. Okay, participants that are working on this, the groups informally work together and we call ourselves DIG, and that stands for Demonstration Garden Group. It's an informal organization that includes the UC Davis uh, Tower Environmental Research Center, the Master Gardeners Slow Foods Lake Tahoe. Um, historically, it has included um, the Talak Historic uh, Association, but they went out of business. Um, we also help out at various gardens. These three groups, uh, three organizations, do the Truckee Demonstration Garden, that's the Slow Foods folks. The North Lake Tahoe Demonstration Garden, that's the uh, Turk folks. The Tahoe City Demonstration Garden, that's also the UC Davis uh, Tahoe Environmental Research Center folks. And then the Tulac Estates Vegetable Garden over at the Pope House, and that's one of my volunteer uh, uh, pro programs that I work with. Um, the geographic area of, of the presentation covers primarily Lake Tahoe and Truckee, but it does extend to uh, Carson Valley and Alpine County that we, we um, help out with. So the classes that we have on Zoom, tonight's uh, Zoom meeting is uh, about squash. And then this Saturday, we'll be uh, redoing it kind of a theater in the round presentation over at the Truckee Demonstration Garden on, on June 4th. Uh, next Wednesday, we have uh, Sue Tansy uh, doing tomatoes, and then she'll follow that up with uh, also a talk in, in Truckee. And then we'll wrap this up with herbs, uh, which we're not sure how that's going to work out, who's doing the presentation yet, uh, how that's going to work out, but that'll be on June 18th. 
Okay. Um, our group provides uh, science-based classes on growing at high elevation. And so um, it's science-based. So uh, if you know that you talk to your plants and they do better, that's great, but we don't necessarily say that or would not say that unless there's some scientific studies that support that, that claim. Uh, you as a participant uh, will receive support on planting and maintaining the crops that we're discussing. Um, we will send out notes and surveys periodically. Uh, if you have a question, we always have an email or email addresses, plural, that we will respond to any inquiry, hopefully in a timely manner. And uh, we're gonna be asking you how things did. And, and that helps us generate a database that shows which varieties of these different crops do best so that in the future, rather than doing these presentations, we would just make recommendations based on, on your work uh, on how well these plants or seeds do. Okay, we want you to be uh, water co watershed conscious. Uh, we want to make sure that our actions as gardeners do not negatively impact the environment and specifically the watershed and the water quality in our areas. Um, you have to be aware that the locating your garden away from streams, away from lakes, percolation basins, will, will help manage erosion, sediment, fertilizer into those uh, water courses and eventually here in Tahoe into the lake. You should uh, try to garden away from a steep slope unless it's terraced where you can control your runoff. And then when you overwater these plants, any nutrients can be pushed below the uh, root zone and, and is not available to your plants, but eventually would get into the groundwater uh, and move towards the lake or um, towards whoever pulls out water from that um, um, aquifer. Um, what the fertilizers that you apply to your plants in your garden that has the same effect on algae and uh, invasive aquatic species in the lake. So over fertilizing, getting those nutrients into the lake will cause a, a, a growth of those algae and invasive aquatic species, uh, which is a, a negative to everyone. Um, when you're applying fertilizers in general, you want to water the plants or water the soil before you do any amendments. This is, helps the amendments stay in place, but also makes them, them uh, much more soluble to penetrate into the root zone. Applying your fertilizer to the dry ground and then watering it in may seem to be an equivalent option, but in reality, it doesn't work as well. And it does lead to uh, some uh, movement of those nutrients away from the plants. You want to use frequent, or not frequent, you want to apply low ratio fertilizers as best you can. It, it has better effects on the plants in most cases, and it has lessening effect on the watershed just because there's fewer nutrients involved. That would be like a 5-5-5 a five, five, five fertilizer versus a 1616. That's the nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. And I put an asterisk there because while it sounds good to use uh, low ratio fertilizers to get the same equivalent pounds per nitrogen or pounds per potassium into the soil, into the plant, you would need more volume. So if you were using a, a 555 and you said, well, I'd like to use something less, uh, not so concentrated, and you went to a manure, which is only uh, one half of a percent nitrogen, then you would have to use a whole lot more volume to get the equivalent amount of nutrients in place. And then again, uh, hold off your fertilizing or your soil amendments if it looks like it's going to be rain or snow. And again, that's, that aids in transport away from your garden and potentially into a watershed. Okay, now let's talk about what we're really here for. We're going to be talking about growing squash. And um, seeds for this have been, uh, we've purchased from um, high mowing seeds. 
all organic seeds. They're grown for us by the University of Nevada, Reno's Desert Farming Initiative that helps small farmers find crops that work. They work with us because we buy so many plants, we're almost like a small farm with you, our participants, being our farmers. A little bit about our squash history. Um, the true squashes, that would be pumpkins and cucumbers and the squashes are native to North and South America. Uh, the cucurbita uh, species are assumed to have been first domesticated by the um, um, native uh, indigenous people about 10,000 years ago, give or take. Um, and then uh, archeological studies um, seem, it appears that the first use of the squash were not for the meat of the squash, but rather for the seeds and for the gourd-like outer coating that was used for storing things. And um, it took about a thousand years based again on, on archeological uh, research and reports, took about a thousand years before the actual uh, squash meat, the, the not the seeds, the meat itself was being consumed. That would be about 9,000 years ago. And, and that was um, about 6,000 years ago before they domesticated uh, corn. So uh, of the three sisters that are, are known in, in North and South America, uh, corn and squash and beans, uh, the squash was actually the first one domesticated and, and used in, in some manner. I thought that was interesting. From a biological standpoint, squash have uh, male and female flowers. In other words, there's a separate flower for the males, separate flower for the females. So pollination has to occur from one flower to the other in some mechanism. And here on this side, I hope you can see my pointer, is the female flower. The ovary beneath the flower is going to be your fruit eventually. And on the, uh, this side here, you can see the male flower. This is closed and very, very narrow stem compared to the female flower. So when you look at, at the plants, you'll be able to tell which is a female flower and which is a male flower. Um, <clears throat> The flowers themselves, both male and female flowers, are edible. They're, they're, they're kind of a delicacy in some trendy restaurants. So uh, if you get a lot of flowers, especially the male flowers, cut them off, put them on your salad. When you're, when you're gardening, a lot of people ask about companion planting. You know, what can I plant with my, my um, squash? And, and the things that you could do plant with your squash would be corn, uh, lettuce, onions, and radishes. And I should have added beans and peas or beans and peas here as well. They would have worked. Um, what you don't want to do, you don't want to plant your squash uh, adjacent to tomatoes, potatoes, and eggplants and peppers. I'll throw that one in too. Um, th there's a su sufficient enough of uh, disease, specifically viruses, that will uh, go to the um, squash from the um, tomato plants or potato plants and uh, affect how well the, the squash does. Many of the squash uh, have tendrils uh, similar to peas and here's some tendrils right there on the side you can see them there and that helps uh, elevate the plant off the ground uh, although if you're going to have uh, a trellis it needs to be a substantial trellis to support the weight of, of the fruit once they get going. So uh, they will hold off the ground. Um, over at the Talak site, we did a demo with pumpkins last year. And we had uh, on the short fence, we had, we had five and six pound pumpkins hanging on the fence. So um, if you're going to be trellising, make sure it's substantial enough to support the weight of the fruit. The squash types that we're gonna be talking about a little bit are um, two, it's not set in stone. There's uh, a great deal of controversy in the scientific papers about the taxonomy between the squash. Some people lump them all into uh, cucurbita pepo, pepo, pepo right here, or they break them into individuals. There's lumpers and splitters 
in the taxonomy. The winter squash typically have a thicker skin, which allows for a longer uh, storing attribute. Um, and examples would be butternut squash, acorn squ squash, pumpkins, and gourds. So these have thicker skins. They are called winter squash because they don't grow in the winter, but you can store them through the winter. Uh, the summer squash, on the other hand, have a much thinner skin. Uh, they have very short uh, storage life. Uh, you, you often eat them in an immature uh, stage um, before the seeds become fully developed. You eat the seeds and all. And examples would be uh, your zucchini and your cucumber and uh, spaghetti squash if, if it's, if it's uh, not mature, fully mature. Okay, uh, one of the things that uh, the Master Gardeners, uh, our Grow Your Own Committee has asked for um, is nutrition facts about what we're asking you to grow. Is it worth it? I mean, what are you getting out of growing this stuff? And so when you look at a summer squash, the nutrition is, is kind of, most of it's water. So based on uh, one medium size zucchini, uh, you only get, uh, you know, 33 calories. Uh, for the medium-sized zucchini, and but you do get for, for potassium, you get 15% of your potassium uh, needs from that. Uh, there's a small amount of fiber, some vitamin A, but look at the vitamin C, 58, 58% just in one medium-sized zucchini. So from a nutrition standpoint, summer squash is uh, pretty good, okay. When you look at winter squash, however, the, the numbers are kind of um, different. This is a one cup. Uh, so it's a little different, not apples to orange comparison, but one cup of uh, winter squash, like a pumpkin or um, um, butternut squash. And when you look at it, the calories are, are more than twice. Potassium is still pretty good. Your fiber increases significantly, but look at your vitamin A. From the orange, you know, a lot of these winter squash has orange meat, screams vitamin A, 457% of your uh, vitamin A uh, needs from one cup of butternut squash or pumpkin or something like that. And, and not too shabby on vitamin C as well. So um, a good source, you know, for your eyes, uh, I guess that's what vitamin A is all about. Um, butternut squash and winter squash. Okay, so uh, if you remember three slides ago or four slides ago, I talked about the indigenous people first using uh, the squash for storage, the gourds, and then also the seeds. So I looked at seeds, looked up squash seeds, and it's kind of interesting. Again, we're looking at one cup here, but the difference here is, uh, look at the fat amount, look at the calories that you get from one cup. So you could see for uh, hunter gathering people or uh, total calories, the seeds were very, could be very important as well as your, your fat. Um, you still get pretty good potassium and your dietary fiber is okay. But when it drops down to uh, vitamin A, vitamin C, uh, pretty low, but now you get your iron, uh, significant quantities of iron. So, um, when you look at the squashes, there is a dietary nutritional profile difference between summer squash like zucchini or cucumbers and winter squash and then also the seeds. So there you go. Okay, planting. Let's talk about planting squash a little bit here. Squash does best in, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Squash is singular and plural. So, uh, so we're talking about, so squash, do best in fertile sandy soil, uh, pH of 6.0 to 7.0. Again, pretty good um, Tahoe-friendly soils. This, the plants really prefer closer to seven than they do six. But um, again, very, very easily achieved here in the Tahoe, uh, Truckee, Carson, and Carson Valley and Alpine County areas. Squash are very cold sensitive, sensitive 
And the seeds might not even germinate if you plant seeds directly, if the soil temperature is below 60 degrees. So if it's above 60, some of them will uh, germinate, but it may take a long time to germinate and your germination rates will be rather low. The warmer the soil, the better. Uh, one of the things when you're planting seeds uh, is consider, you should consider hilling them up. That's raising a, a mound of dirt above the general surface of, the, of your garden. That increases the uh, temperature of the soil a little bit. Um, it also means that water will percolate through that mound a little quicker. So uh, watering, you have to compensate watering. Also nutrients will leach out through that mound. But for increasing soil temperatures, that's one way to do it. Uh, another way, uh, as you see in this lower uh, left-hand corner is to use some type of ground cover or other strategy to increase your soil temperature. Here they're using black, soil, uh, black plastic that will radiate heat uh, back to the plant and warm slightly the uh, soil underneath. If you use clear plastic or um, a transparent red plastic, then you'll get benefits from increasing the soil temperatures much more, but it will also reflect uh, and warm up the plant as well. So, um, so similar to tomatoes, you want to do everything possible to keep your squash warm and comfortable. When you plant your seeds, you plant them only an inch deep, but you want to plant them with an edge pl uh, placement. So you see the seeds over here, the pumpkin seeds over here, you're seeing the flat side. So what you wanna do is plant them on the edge and uh, preferably point narrow in down, uh, but it's not, um, essential. It's more, it's more important to just get it on its edge when you put it in its hole. And then uh, typically the germination is seven, eight, eight to 12 days, a little longer if you have uh, cooler soil. So keep that in mind if you're, again, um, trying to plant um, direct from seeds. If you're transplanting though, you want to make sure because the the plants are uh, cold sensitive. You wanna harden them off for a day or two or three before you place them in the ground. This, the squash are root sensitive to transplanting. So when you do do your transplanting, uh, be careful in handling the plant, the roots. Don't try to fluff up the roots and spread them out. Uh, it, it will do more harm. You're better off placing it in the whole plant into the hole that's been prepared and then lightly tapping it down so there's good soil root contact and then um, that will get them going. Because the uh, many of the squash are vining plants, uh, you can consider covering up portions of the vine to encourage secondary rooting. This will allow you to get more moisture to the uh, plant um, and help uh, in, in growth and development. Um, what you don't wanna do is let the soil dry out and try to keep the leaves dry. So overhead <coughs> sprinkling, overhead, overhead irrigation, if at all possible, um, don't do that. If you have to do it, then do it in mid morning or so, so there's plenty of time for the leaves to dry off before the coolness of, of the evening uh, occurs. Um, the reason you don't wanna let the soil dry out, the leaves of squash are very large. And so they transpire a lot of water. Uh, when they start drying out, they'll wilt quickly. When they wilt, one of the first things that happen, they'll, they'll start to drop fruit um, very quickly. And so you can lose a portion of your crop uh, if the soil dries out. Okay, you can grow squash in containers. A uh, five gallon container uh, would be like for two plants of the same species. I wouldn't try to grow a zucchini and a pumpkin, but two zucchini, two pumpkin plants in a five gallon container, um, you're, you should be good to go. Uh, watch your watering and all that kind of stuff. Make sure you have drain holes. You guys know what's going on there. Uh, 
as mentioned before, many of the uh, squash plants are vine-like plants with tendrils. So um, they can be grown uh, onto a trellis or some support, he uh, heavy duty enough to support the weight of the plants. And that allows you to use less space in your garden for squash by going vertical rather than letting it grow along the ground. Squash are heavy feeders, so we're recommending that you fertilize um, on a monthly basis. And that, that would be for, if you're mounding, if you're mounding a uh, soil and that's the way you're planting and you have four plants per mound, then we're talking about uh, a 10, 10, 10, uh, fertilizer, about two tablespoons per mound sprinkled around uh, that's already been watered and then let that uh, get to the roots. So you're not looking at a lot of fertilizer, but you're looking at regular fertilization to get these plants up and going. And again, I'm, I can't stress this enough, don't let the soil dry out or you'll lose your crop and possibly the plants. Squash do need pollinators to move the pollen from the male flower to the female flower. So pollinators are important. Um, harvesting, most of the squash that, most squash can be harvested before they mature. The problem will be that there won't be mature seeds in case you're doing seed saving, but you can uh, harvest an uh, immature plant, the earlier they are, the more like they, they will be to a summer squash rather than a winter squash. And, and this picture is exactly what we're talking about, where you have a butternut squash, one that was allowed to ripen to a full mature plant, the seeds inside this would be available for seed saving. The, the smaller one is one that was harvested uh, much younger uh, and as long as it's not green, it's you can harvest it. If it's green, you can still harvest it, but you may have to treat it more like a summer squash than a winter squash. And, and, and its storage uh, before it's mature may not be quite as good. I think that makes sense. And then, oh, when, they're, when you wanna harvest them when they're uh, mature, how do you tell when it's mature for a winter squash? For a winter squash, it's when the stem hardens off and starts turning brown or gray, then, then it's, it's ready to harvest as a mature fruit. Now for zucchini and summer squash, and to a certain extent, spaghetti squash, uh, you can harvest those whenever you feel the size is appropriate for your needs. Squash pollinization. I mentioned you need a pollinator and there's a couple, couple things that you could do. One, uh, you can self you can use your hand pollination and that's you can use this <coughs> excuse me you can use an artist paintbrush or a fine comb or a toothbrush and then you wipe across the male anthers that's where the pollen is and then across the female stigma that's where the uh, opening to the ovaries would be uh, it's best to do this early in the morning because the flowers of squash close up uh, mid-afternoon or early afternoon. <clears throat> a second way to do it, as this, as this picture shows right here, as this picture shows, is, is to take a male flower, uh, cut off the petals so that only the male anthers, the pollen containing structure is showing, and then use that to brush across the um, female anthers. Um, so that's one, or you can wait for help uh, from the insect world. Uh, bumblebees, beetles, bugs, butterflies can pollinate uh, squash plants. Um, squash bees in particular are, are an important uh, um, organism for fertilizing squ squash plants. A couple things here. Um, early in the season, you'll get uh, flowers, but you may not have your pollinators. So hand pollination uh, early on in the season might be the best practical way to achieve 
uh, fruiting. Uh, as the season goes on and the number of uh, pollinators increase, uh, then you don't necessarily need to do hand pollinization and um, get away with that. The other thing I'd like to mention here while we're on this slide is this squash bee. Squash bees kind of look like a honeybee. Uh, they're a little slightly um, more stocky looking, more robust looking. Uh, they're solitary bees, so they don't make a hive. Um, what happens is that the, both the male and the female bees go out and fly and collect uh, pollen and nectar uh, for their own own use. Um, unlike the on our back wall here, the honeybee, where the male bee, the drone bee, doesn't even leave the hive unless there's a new queen to fertilize. Kind of. Well, <laughs> let's leave it at that. The the uh, squash bees, though, the difference between the male, the habit of the male and the female is kind of interesting. The male is just interested in, in uh, making sure he finds a female and then feeding his face. Whereas the female not only is looking for um, uh, somebody, someone to fertilize her so her eggs are fertile, but she also goes and digs a hole up to a foot deep, lays an egg, fills the egg chamber with pollen so that the larva will have something to eat, and then also feeds herself. The, Females then go from flower to flower to flower, and then when they get enough pollen, enough nectar from the female plant, they go to where they're building their nest, burrowing down and, and depositing some of that. Um, whereas the male just goes looking for a female, and then when he gets tired, he will actually uh, sometimes, quite frequently, go into a, a squash flower, and as the afternoon closes it, he will just stay in there and enjoy life until this morning when the flower opens and then he'll continue his quest for finding a female and feeding his face. So kind of an interesting um, life cycle for this um, bee. Um, oh yeah, the other thing about squash bees, squash bees are endemic basically to uh, Central America and South America. However, as squash was cultivated throughout uh, North America and South America by the indigenous people, they actually expanded the territory for uh, the squash fly. And so they are much more abundant now uh, in North and South America, just from people growing uh, squash. So um, kind of a increased distribution occurrence of this insect based on agricultural practices of both the indigenous people and now um, us gardeners. So <clears throat> pest, when you're talking about pest in squash, you have a few. One is this uh, squash vine borer, which is actually a moth. So the moth uh, lays an egg on the stem of a, um, uh, a squash plant, this, the egg hatches into a larva, a caterpillar, and it eats its way through the stem, uh, causing, you can see it uh, occasionally, there'll be small holes and you actually uh, can open up the hole and, and dig out the, that's one of the options is to dig out the um, caterpillar and kill it and, and uh, get rid of it that way. If the infestation is too great, there's too many holes, the, the plant will wither and die. The moth itself, the adult, almost looks like a, a hornet or a wasp. Doesn't look like your typical um, moth. The giveaway, of course, are the antenna. The other one that you may come across are your squash bugs. These are true bugs. And the best way to deal with them is if you find them uh, flick them off and step on them or squish them. You can squash your squash bug, basically. Uh, cucumber beetles and squash beetles are other pests. Um, the, this squash beetle um, kind of looks like a off-color ladybug, ladybird beetle, um, but it's actually um, uh, herbivore. It eats the leaves. 
Uh, over here is what the uh, pupa looks like. Uh, and it also eats leaves. And it's, it's a beetle. And then we have the ubiquitous aphids, which um, uh, you can use um, insecticidal soaps, neem's oil solutions. Um, there's all kinds of things for aphid control, uh, including water sprays and soap. Um, and you just want to main. You just want to keep the population down, uh, unless the population is extremely high. Uh, it does not affect the quality of the fruit, the, the squash that you get, um, and it ju it just is um, uh, unsightly. But it doesn't affect the unless it's a huge population. It doesn't affect uh, the plant very much. It's very tolerant of of aphids. Um, with aphids, of course, you will get ants. And that's kind of a pain in the butt if you're uh, gardening and suddenly you have ants all over you, biting and stuff like that, but um, aphids by themselves. Okay, diseases uh, of uh, the squash, a uh, couple things. One is uh, mildews, the downy mildew and powdery mildew. Uh, basically, these are controlled by your watering practices and air circulation around the plant. So if the plant is getting a whole lot of sun and is very compact, uh, where air circulation is may be an issue, then feel free to trim out a couple of the leaves so that it gets more sunlight, more uh, air circulation, and that reduces the risk of mildew occurring. Uh, watering uh, early in the morning, if you're using overhead mid-morning, if you early, water early, early in the morning, uh, that, that temperature shock to the plant does affect the plant. So if you wait till mid-morning, still gives you plenty of time for the leaves to dry out if you're using overhead sprinklers. But if at all possible, uh, drip irrigation or uh, just putting water down along the base of the plant. And then, oh, let me go back here. And then the last one is this blossom rot. Um, and blossom rot is kind of an, um, oh gosh, sorry. But blossom rot is due to a lack of calcium in your soils. Here in Tahoe, you don't have a lot of calcium in your soils. Uh, so uh, when you start pushing your pH up to that seven level, one of the things you can do is use uh, a calcium um, soil amendment uh, there's a lot of home remedies for that. One is uh, taking eggshells, a lot of eggshells. If you just put eggshells in the soil, it, it'll take forever and a day for the uh, calcium to break down and be available to the plant. But you can speed that along by taking your eggshells, boil, boiling them in water with a tablespoon or two of vinegar, lowering the pH, dissolving the um, uh, calcium, and then letting that cool and putting that in your, your uh, garden uh, if you have a calcium deficiency. Another, another uh, uh, trick is to take uh, antacid pills like, uh, well, whatever one is, calcium-based, pound those up, put those in hot water, add a tablespoon of um, um, vinegar, uh, white vinegar, and uh, don't seal it up because it will foam. It will ca cause uh, gas to, so leave that and then use that uh, is another uh, trick that you could use uh, for blossom rot. Early season uh, blossom rot that you may think is early season blossom rot is not necessarily early season blossom rot. It's rather that the flower has not been fertilized because lack of pollinators. And so the in dying, it looks very similar to blossom rot. So again, early in the season, you'll see this a lot of times and it has nothing to do with lack of calcium. It has everything to do with lack of uh, pollinators in your, your area. So let's talk about what we have to offer this time. Each person that signs up for this uh, workshop and gets the plants should get 
two plants of each of the four varieties, so eight plants total. That's the that's in theory how this is supposed to work based on what they told me happened at the, the greenhouses. The first kind we're talking about is, is uh, a zucchini. This is dark star. We've trialed this over at the Talak Estates uh, last year, and we were very successful in getting uh, zucchini. This is kind of an interesting one. It's perfect for a container or small space gardening because it's more of a bush zucchini type. It doesn't have the long uh, vines of zucchini. It's more of a, a compact uh, plant. So for small gardens or container gardening, this is an excellent one to try. And we're, we expect you to get some zucchini 50 to 60 days from your transplant. So part of that 50 to 60 days is how big you want your zucchini. And the other one is how warm it is. If it's cool, it's going to take longer than if it, you have nice, warm, sunny days. And for sunny days in Thailand, we're still talking only about 70 degrees, 75 degrees, and evening temperatures in the 40s um, easily. So uh, that uh, transplant day might be extended uh, beyond 60 days, even if we have a cool, uh, cloudy summer. And again, with zucchini, you can harvest it in, on an immature basis. Whenever it's big enough for you to think that you'd like to eat it, you can take it. This particular variety is somewhat um, more drought resistant than other zucchinis. Not, not that you don't want to let the soil dry out, but it's slightly less. It is interesting. It was developed in Humboldt County, California by the Organic Seed Alliance in Eel River Produce. Uh, it, it was, it's, it is a commercial variety. So um, because of that, you can count on it being productive. Um, should be a fun one to, to try if you like zucchini or zucchini bread or fried zucchini or raw zucchini or anything. The next one, we also trialed this at um, um, the Talak Estates last year. And what we found on this one is this is one that did show um, that blossom end rot during the season. And we added some uh, ground up um, uh, antacid tablets with a little vinegar and water and used that. And within a week, the flower were sitting fruit again. So this is one that where it may be sensitive to lack of calcium. Um, it's an upright plant, makes it easy to harvest. When you're harvesting uh, squash, uh, summer squash, where the fruit is not mature. Remember we mentioned for winter squash, the stem uh, of the fruit was turning brown or gray. And you can see here, these are green. We're, we're harvesting them uh, somewhat immature. So use a good pair of uh, kitchen shears or garden shears or sharp knife, being careful um, that you don't stab yourself. <clears throat> Um, to, to cut them off. This is a variety that was developed by the University of New Hampshire. Uh, so again, New Hampshire is far enough north where it's uh, cool uh, weather, especially in the uh, uh, fall. So um, um, should do well here. It's a hybrid. So the seeds that you do collect may not be true to the variety. So if you're into seed saving and you decide to save the seeds, boy, that's hard to say. If you decide to save the seeds from the smooth operator summer squash, then, then uh, um, you, you, those seeds might not be true to form. Uh, still will produce fruit uh, squash, still will look something like this, but it might not be identical. Uh, this one also is very prolific as far as fruiting goes. So frequent harvesting will cause the plant to set more and more flowers. So the more frequently you harvest them, the more flowers will be produced. Um, let's see. If you do decide to save the seeds um, and let this really mature and that stem starts turning brown to harvest for the seeds and you want, still wanna eat the fruit, you may have to peel the outside the skin off because it does get kind of uh, tough at that point. 
<clears throat> this is one that I chose because I have not a clue if it's going to work. So please try it. Let me know how it goes. Uh, I like spaghetti squash. Uh, buy it at the store. Uh, the days, 90 to 95 days, really pushing our, our window of our growing season here in, in Thailand. So it's a bit chancy. Uh, it's a semi bush, again, perfect for uh, gardening in small areas or gardening if you have containers. Uh, you wanna harvest this mature as soon as you don't see an increasing uh, size development. So at some point it's going to stop getting bigger and at that point you can harvest it. And again, if you know it's mature, the stem here, you can see very easily, the stem is turned brownish uh, gray and uh, ready to be harvested. Um, <clears throat> so you can actually harvest them as an immature fruit, treating it as a, more as a summer squash as well. So pretty, pretty uh, nice plant. I'm very interested to see how this is going to go for our, our gardens. The last one is the Brulee butternut squash. This is a true butternut squash. It is a uh, winter squash. It has very good storage uh, qualities. <clears throat> it was developed by uh, Cornell University. It is, <clears throat> it is an early producer and it does have multiple fruit per plant. However, we are pushing that 90 day mark again. So uh, let's hope that we get mature plants. But again, with butternut squash, you can harvest it as an immature, smaller squash. You won't get any mature seeds for seed saving and um, it, it won't be very large. Um, so this, this one, in our research, this one is going to be our best shot at getting a, a butternut squash here in Tahoe. Down in uh, uh, Carson Valley, uh, you probably have 15, 20, 30 more days of growing season down there. And, and uh, I'm sure that this one will do well in those situations. Okay, so let's see how we're doing. Um, <clears throat> so real quickly, the, the 2010, according to the National Garden Bureau was the year of the squash. Uh, April 25th is uh, National Zucchini Bread Day, if you like doing. The, uh, the Great Northern Squash Festival in Foxborough, Wisconsin, coming up in September. This one is more of a um, music festival that just happens to have a small amount of squash as its partner. And then if those of you who are in the Hayward, California area, and like zucchini, August 21st and 22nd is the zucchini festival, as is the September 2 to the 5 in Obitz, Ohio. Um, the cucumber festival and tractor show is uh, in August in Wisconsin. And the California watermelon festival is in June in Silmar, California, although watermelon is not technically a squash. And then, of course, we're boycotting the International Cucumber Festival in, which is mid, all midsummer in Suzdal, uh, Russia. So we're boycotting that one. So forget it. Okay, last little couple little things that I like. Uh, <clears throat> the first mention of the pumpkin, which is squash, um, uh, in Cinderella was in uh, 1697. Um, I actually uh, tried to get Disney to give me permission, but it's still pending. So I don't know. So I went with that one. Uh, the interesting because uh, the first known uh, written record of people growing squash in Europe for food was 1591. So before 1591, this Cinderella story, which goes back um, at least uh, to 63 BC and probably a thousand years before that, um, they didn't have pumpkin, so the carriage couldn't be made out of pumpkin. But 
anyway, the, the Cinderella story is kind of interesting. It, it, originally back in the early Greeks had it, a slave girl marries the Pharaoh. And it's based on the slave girl's sandal being taken by an eagle and dropped on the next to the Pharaoh. And he said, whoever has this slipper will be my queen and then they sent out people to find the person who fit the slipper and there's all kinds of people cutting off their anyway enough of that um so really that's it for me so questions or comments you can email me at this uh, email address uh this will be posted on our youtube channel uh in the next week 10 days something like that uh, as you can see when i'm not talking gardening i'm out uh, fishing um so so that's going to be it let's wrap this up again zoom classes uh, are wednesdays 6 to 7 30 the garden talks at uh, the Truckee demonstration garden is at 10 o'clock in Truckee. rain snow or wind uh we did tonight we did the uh squash tomatoes next week the following week are herbs and spices i think um Again, this is where you can register. This is where you pick up our pick up locations. I'll like tell a cup of coffee at the uh, Y there, uh, Verde Grill, uh, Big Five parking lot, Truckee at the Demonstration Garden, and at UC Davis in Tahoe City at the Field Station, the old hatchery uh, on Lake uh, Forest Road. You can pick up your uh, plants. And again, two plants four varieties, eight plants, so you should have plenty of uh, squash to play with. Um, Is the kids today? Now then, I'm done, I'm finished, it's all over. So, questions? Dave, this is yeah. Cindy. I have two questions for you that I pulled out of the chat. Only the first, two? Only two so far. The first one is, can or do any of the squash pests actually serve as pollinators for the flowers? Uh, yeah, the actually, very, very good, very good question, very good question. Uh, the the beetles actually do do some pollinization, uh, but they're more interested in eating the pollen as opposed to fertilizing. But in the in the process of eating the pollen and then going to the female plant and starting to eat the anther, there is some pollinization. So the beetles actually do some pollinization, but they're a pest. So, hey, what's the next one, Cindy? Uh, next question, you might have answered it later on in your presentation, but the question was, are squash bees native to Tahoe? Oh, great question. The, the answer is, Yes, there are native cucurbids in the Tahoe Basin that the bees utilize, but they're not very often found. But when you're talking about solitary bees in the Tahoe, greater Tahoe, uh, Carson Valley area, there are solitary bees that are squash bees. Not all solitary bees are squash bees, but uh, there are a few. Um, there's been reports of them. And uh, again, uh, one of the ways you can tell if you have squash bees, if, if some of the flowers have bees in them uh, in the evening or when you see them open up and there's a bee in that, uh, that's almost certain, certainly a squash male bee. They're the only ones that we know of that do, does that on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. And then we just got one more question. If you harvest your squash flowers, does that diminish the yield of your plant? Great. So if you harvest the female flowers, the answer is potentially yes. However, if you... Uh, harvest the male flowers but leave enough male flowers around the females for pollinization to occur either by hand or by insects <clears throat> then it won't it won't affect the overall production but um you know don't don't leave just one male flower to fertilize uh 10 female flowers 
Although at a bar scene, that might be not bad, but in flowers, it's not, it's, it's not a good ratio. And then after you harvest the flowers, do you know how long you can keep them? You know, shelf life, refrigerator? Uh, you can put them in a refrigerator for a day or two most. Then they get kind of uh, wilty or squishy. Okay. Okay. Do you want to open it up then to anybody else listening and want to share your thoughts yeah. or comments? Yes, uh, I've opened the um, questions of un unmuted folks. If you'd like to ask questions um, and show your video, please do so. Um, I have a question. Okay, who are we I'm speaking to? This is Cyan. Hi. Hi. I, <laughs> I'm a beginner Tahoe gardener and I bought this thing called the Garden Tower 2.0 that's like a big tower that kind of has rings that go around a central composting unit and you can plant like tons of plants in, in a very small square footage, which I thought was a great idea. But after watching this, I'm wondering if it's really not a good idea to try to cram a bunch of plants into such a small space no you as long as you have your watering down so that you can water everything kind of uniformly as long as the plants that you've selected have similar nutritional needs as far as fertilizing uh, then i would think you would be okay you may want to look at compa what companion plants are nearby i'm not sure that that would work for things like potatoes or, or something like that that you actually have to dig up but you should be fine you should be fine with with that don't don't give up in fact um uh, if you're doing that then you might want to put the squash in a location for uh if you're using the vining type like the spaghetti squash the uh summer squash and the um uh butternut squash the vining ones you may want to put them uh, near the bottom so they can spread out a little bit rather than having them grow down your your tower. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's what it suggested to put squash and vining stuff near the bottom and um, tomatoes and pepper type things on the very top so they can go up um, and then. But yeah. I just wasn't sure about the companion planting. How far away does something need to be if it's not a compatible companion? You know, that that kind of depends on the health of the plants uh, at Talak. Uh, we've done tomatoes right next to strawberries, which is supposed to be a no-no. And both of them did very well. But both of them, both of the groups of plants were very healthy. They didn't have a lot of disease. They didn't have a lot of bugs. They didn't have, so as long as they're as long as they're healthy and not diseased or have bugs or aphids or anything like that, oh. you, can, you can probably get away with pretty close approximation. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's really helpful. Okay, and then I know we're running low on almost out of time here, um, but there was one other question out of sure. the chat. And the question is, I have an area like a raised bed that is constructed of railroad ties. Do you know if that type of wood has been treated and would not be safe to use for vegetables? Well, okay, railroad ties. Okay, so railroad ties are um, a type of treated wood that resist um, decay. Creosote and other cancer-causing compounds were used to preserve the wood. Creosote and other similar types of cancer-causing compounds can leach into the soil and have been known to affect the um, performance of your plants. Since we're dealing with squash, we're, you're, you're less worried about it than if you were digging potatoes, for example, or onions or garlic. But uh, railroad ties are not anything close to being the ideal uh, material for uh, growing vegetables. <clears throat> if you were had to use it because that's just because of what you had, 
and and you were building it, then you might consider lining it uh, with an impermeable membrane of some kind to prevent uh, the creosote and other compounds from migrating into the soil. But hope that doesn't dissuade you of trying squash. And actually, I misspoke. We have till 7.30 for more questions. So you can either put them in the chat or you can just ask them directly. Or, 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 we, can, or we can stop early and, and go have a glass of wine. Okay, what else do we, what else do we got, Cindy? There's no other questions in the chat. So unless somebody has... Well, well let's give question. people... To, yeah, question. if anybody has a question, just... just uh, Introduce yourself and tell us what it is. Otherwise, we'll wait a minute or two and then we'll wrap this thing up. I have a question. Who is this? Valerie. Oh, Valerie. Okay. What's up, kid? Hi. We have um, a, a greenhouse. And so our floor space, of course, is limited, as a lot of people are. So what size of a container should I use? You said five gallon. But does it need to be deep for the roots, or can I well, get one that's you, elongated? Like a, a five gallon, a five gallon paint bucket, a five gallon felt bag. So you you have basically about as much width as you have height. Okay, great. And the, and two plants can go in there. Two plants of the same variety could go there. <clears throat> now, if you're using, let me clarify that. If, you're, you, if we're talking about two of the dark star zucchini, which are bush types, they're going to be very crowded because you're not vining away from that. So in, if you're using that particular variety, you could still put two in there, but be aware that it's going to be very crowded since they're a bush type rather than a vine type. Oh, okay. And there All was right. just one more question in the chat. What grows next to squash? Wait, what, what grows next to squash? Right, probably like a good companion plant for squash. Com Com well, you could do the three sisters, which would be corn, uh, although squash will grow much faster than corn will. So if you're starting your corn now, forget it. <laughs> the squash will overwhelm the corn. Peas and beans would be another one. Uh, beans being uh, native to uh, North America. Uh, the three sisters squash corn and, and beans that, that would I be think, great I think Those too in one of our earlier presentations um, Heather might have mentioned squash beans and sunflowers instead of corn which would be yeah so, sunflowers is, is a, another one but again um, here in Tao this squash will outgrow the sunflower hands down so if you have a, 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 a squash with a vine and tendrils, it'll actually it'll actually bring down the sunflower because just just because of the um, the rate of growth of the sunflower and corn compared to the rate of growth for the squash. Squash once they get going really grow fast. So. And Melissa in the chat just suggested using sunchokes for the, one of the. Sisters, so that would be nice too. Oh, Melissa, 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 and her son chokes. Yes, again, you could do that, but this, I, I, I'm telling you, the squash, once it gets established, will outgrow the sun chokes hands down and, and will just not try, will try to grow up it, but will just bring down the sun choke. It, it, it'll be a tough go if you have uh, one of the squash that have tendrils and are, are growing up. And then I, oh, go ahead, Mary, sorry. Uh, I have a, a question regarding growing in a, um, a greenhouse. Would you have to manually um, fertilize those or do the- Pollinate, you mean pollinate? Uh, for, okay, so pollinate. if you're growing in a greenhouse and you don't have a way to let insects in, which is probably not what you wanna do with a greenhouse, then you would have to manually fertilize either using you know the the toothbrush a paintbrush or uh taking a male flower and stripping it naked and then rubbing its pollen all over the female 
Panthers. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, guys? Yes. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. A question about um, potatoes. Karen missed her potato pickup and she'd like to know um, where she can pick up her potatoes and if it's too late. We, we, do, have, we do have some potatoes, seed potatoes available. Um, if she emails one of us her location, I will be taking a bunch of potatoes that were missed to Truckee on Saturday. So we'll have plenty of potatoes in Truckee. Uh, I know that, um, I think who one of us on Saturday took a bunch home. Um, I'm trying to think who, who, one of the, we do have potatoes. So what we need to know is where you, where you are so we can get you the potatoes. Okay, care, Not care. that we're making home delivery of all these plants, but if it's a one-off <laughs> thing, I think we can make it work. Karen, go ahead and speak up. I will be picking up on Saturday if they could be there when I pick up my squash. Okay. Where? 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 What location? Oh, I'm sorry, in Tahoe City. I will make sure that you have potatoes in Tahoe City. Thank you. I'm so sorry. We were busy. No, not at all. Okay, you, there you guys. go. Melissa came through. Melissa, you have potatoes still? Thank you. I do. Okay, there you go. She's Problem solved. Lady. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anything else, folks? Ugh. Just one other question out of the chat. Is scaffolding important? Is what important? Squash, scaffolding or some kind of a support. No, no, no. You can you can grow. For example, let's let's take an extreme example: pumpkins. So pumpkins have the tendrils, and pumpkins like to grow on trellises that have enough support to hold a a, a, a pumpkin. But if you don't have the support, then what's going to happen is your plants just going to be sprawling all over with pumpkins in what they would call I don't know a pumpkin patch. So that's what it would look like. So uh, if you like Linus and peanuts and want a pumpkin patch, you don't need any trellises for pumpkins. Same thing with, with uh, butternut squash or any of the other uh, vining squashes. Even though you could grow them on a trellis to save space, it's not absolutely necessary. Oh, one of the other things I, I'll say about the, the, the vining type, uh, if you cut off the terminal end of the vine, it will send out lateral stems that will have uh, additional flowers. And you can actually, if you're doing this sprawling type thing, you can actually increase the number of, of uh, stems, flowers, and fruit by cutting off the terminal uh, end of the uh, initial uh, vine after it gets about three foot or four feet long. And then you'll have um, more opportunity for more squash or pumpkins or whatever you're growing. Okay, is that it now? I mean, I don't want to rush anybody. No more questions in the chat. Okay, well, I would like to personally thank everybody who attended, everybody who asked uh, questions, everybody who did follow up, because this is very important to us to get your feedback, get all these stuff. But for me, it's just fun to do. And for Cindy, it's fun to hear your voices. And for uh, Melissa and Mary, Annie, we all love hearing from you guys. We love talking to you about this stuff. So I hope you attend next week's sure. tomato presentation and the following week's herb and spices. And with that, I'm really done. Cindy, you have anything to say before we cut this off and stop the recording? No, just thank you everyone for participating tonight. And thank you, Dave. That was really interesting presentation. Oh, great. Thank Thanks. You. Okay. Dave. Dave, We're off. Good night. Dave. Bye. Dave, Cindy, will you stay on? Mary?